our very special speaker because I always... And you all have to um, be warned. Uh, uh, service will end a bit late. Uh. <laughs> so now you know who the special speaker is, right? Okay, our special speaker is none other than our very, very own Pastor Koi. Let's put our hand together and welcome him. Okay, thank you, Pastor Melinda. I think probably today I uh, should be ending a bit earlier. <laughs> you know why? Because uh, um, sometimes this is the third time I'm preaching this week, uh, and uh, and the, this is the third congregation. Uh, so. So I think uh, I am running out of steam. <laughs> All right, <laughs> is that good or bad news? Huh? So today the um, the title uh, of my message is the power of the Holy Spirit. And if uh, you all care to remember, in my years in TOP, I believe uh, I have not had at any occasion preached about the power of the Holy Spirit. Eh? And today I am led by the Lord to teach about the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, it, will, um, it will not be something that covers everything that the Holy Spirit does. Eh? Because if I do that, really, really, it will be very long. <laughs> so I have taken the snippets uh, a bit out, which is uh, what I believe the Lord wants all of us to be aware. And I want to start by saying that um, as the church prepares for 2018, what is needed is this consciousness, this awareness in us of the reality of the person of the Holy Spirit. I know, I mean, uh, after we have uh, been Christians a long while, we know there is a Holy Spirit. But today, I want to go a step further. Is that consciousness, the awareness that the Holy Spirit is working in you on a daily basis, that the Holy Spirit is working in the church, even though you may not see it directly, but He is there all the time. That today, even as I come up here, sitting there praying, Oh Lord, anoint me, that there is, Indeed, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Now, this is what I mean by that consciousness and that awareness. And here is where I want to mention a little bit about the Trinity. <laughs> that we serve one God. That is in Deuteronomy 6. Then... As the Bible develops and uh, progresses, then the, the man of God slowly begin to realize that God is three persons. So there is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit. And God the Father, we call him the first person of the Godhead, God the Son, the second person of the Godhead, and God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. And how to square all this? I have, uh, after working at it for many, many years, I'm not exaggerating because I teach it, right? <laughs> so I have to work at it. I think I will rest at the fact that we use these terms. There is one being of God, but that one being of God, in that one being, there are three persons of God. My mom asked me many years ago, 
when she heard about this from her church, and I tried to explain to her in Hokkien, you it takes a miracle. Huh? After one hour, she looked at me and said, <laughs> in Hokkien means I'm even more confused, so, so I gave up. So I said, just, there's one God, and God is three persons. So I want to uh, begin to, uh, with uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And uh, I believe all of us, we are very well aware of this verse because it is a cardinal verse of the assemblies of God. And in this verse, chapter 1 of the book of Acts, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Here, Jesus is speaking to the disciples before he ascended to heaven. And a few verses before verse 8, Jesus actually told them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the gift that the Father has promised. And that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, in verse 4, the Bible records, and Luke writes, all of them, the 120 disciples in the upper room, were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit enabled them. Now, first, we have to understand, and I started, that the Holy Spirit is a person, it's not a force. And that is where some uh, of those who are young in faith, if they ever meet a Jehovah Witness along the way, they will be taught that the Holy Spirit is a force, an energy, and He is not a person. And that is where they slowly sway away from the tenets of the faith. So today, I want to ask you to think. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Bible describes to us, and as we exige the Bible, we must understand the Bible tells us that the attributes of God are present in all three imperfection. There is no lack of holiness in the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit. There is no lack of holiness in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, even though He incarnated and became a man. There is no lack of holiness in God the Father. I'm taking just one attribute. In terms of the other attributes of omnipotence, omniscience and all that, all the attributes, they are held in perfection in each of the persons of the Godhead. But, having said that, we have to understand that in each of these persons, there is a focus on a certain attribute. When we read God the Father, what comes to mind? Now, I have to do this slowly because uh, some of the words I use, I think I got some feedback. Some people, uh, maybe the younger ones may know, know what I'm talking about. Uh. When you look at, when we see God the Father, what comes out is what we call the transcendent, glorious majesty of God. When you see God the Father, that impression of the Almighty comes to the fore. That glorious majesty. And the word transcendent means there is an otherness to it. He is not someone like us. He is a different being. He is God, the infiniteness of God, the infinity of God the otherness of God, the very fact that He is beyond all comprehension, that one comes true when we say and look at God the Father, that transcendent, glorious majesty. What about Jesus? 
when we look at God the Son, the second person of the Godhead, what comes into focus is the immanent agape love of God. In Jesus, you will find that the person of Christ, as it, he is exhibited and he is expressed to us, is held by Romans 5 verse 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is the love of God. And the word immanent means the nearness. That is why Jesus can say that we are brothers. That's why Jesus can call us friends. That God has incarnated to become a man. That in the perfect God and the perfect man, in the person of the second person of the Godhead in Jesus Christ, we sense, we are focused, we become aware of that immanent agape love of God. Today, I want to ask, what about the Holy Spirit? When you look at the person of the Holy Spirit, when you read about the Holy Spirit, and here it is revealed to us in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. It does not say you will receive love when the Holy Spirit comes. It does not say you will receive glory when the Holy Spirit comes. It does not mean that the Holy Spirit does not express the perfect love of God. He does. It does not mean that the Holy Spirit does not have the perfect glory of God. He does. But as He is expressed to us, when we look into the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is meant to manifest to us that power of God, that dunamis power of God. So the Holy Spirit comes to us when we look at the Holy Spirit, when we say, anoint us. We are actually looking into the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why my title is titled, The Power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to examine this power. What power is there in the Holy Spirit? This Holy Spirit's power is not a natural power. It is a supernatural power. The Holy Spirit's power is not a human power. It is a spiritual power. That's why in the Holy person of the Holy Spirit, we will experience that supernatural, spiritual power of God. And this is what Tabernacle of Praise needs for 2018. That supernatural, spiritual power. And for the next hour, I want to work on this supernatural, spiritual power. I want to begin with the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are so many places where the power of the Holy Spirit is expressed in so many different ways. But I want to talk about this dear person, Samson. And in Judges 14.6, if you turn to your Bible, we have this verse talking about Samson. That Samson met a lion. And in Judges, Chapter 14, verse 6. The Bible records, The Spirit of the Lord, that's the Holy Spirit, came upon him in power. That the Holy Spirit came upon Samson in power, so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands, as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Now the Bible describes... And the word the Bible uses for the lion is, if you look at it, some translations will put it very well. It was a young lion. It was a matured lion. It was not a lion cub or whatever. It was strong. And the Bible wants to give this impression to us that the lion came against Samson. And Samson was endowed and dealt with that 
supernatural strength that the Holy Spirit gave him, and he tore the lion with his bare hands, just as if he was tearing a young goat. And it revealed to us how great that supernatural power can be. Because you have to understand that the, in those times, the lion is supposed to be a mighty beast with great strength. And Samson just tore it apart. Today, I think uh, when you pray to the Holy Spirit, I think none of you would pray to be like Samson to be given that supernatural strength to tear lions. Huh? Because these days, they can just shoot the lions with a gun. Huh? So they don't have to tear it. But this gives us an idea of the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. So right now, today, how does the power of the Holy Spirit manifest in our lives today? I am not trying to make you all Samson's uh, so that when you go out, you can tear lions and tigers and elephants, uh, okay? But if you look into the scripture, and we have to move into the New Testament, I want to begin with Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, we meet two people who are so very different from Samson. And these two persons go by the name of, you're very familiar with them, Peter and John. As far as I know, I don't think Peter and John are very well built. Huh? The way I look at it, they write scripture. I think they are, they are softer people probably. Huh? Fishermen, so stronger than us, right? But not like Samson. And in Acts chapter 4 verse 8, we have, Luke writing, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them. And then verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that this man had been with Jesus. What was the context? The context was, if you read Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they were going to the temple and then there was a man who was lame or crippled from birth and then uh, Peter look at the person and then says, look at me in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The man jumped up, he was healed. The power of the Holy Spirit in healing was manifest. The man was praising God. The whole Jerusalem there, they were all so excited. Peter and John was preaching about Jesus. And then came these religious leaders. They came together, ganged together, arrested both of them, took them and asked them, what are you trying to do? And then in verse 8, Peter, before the assembly of religious leaders, and you know the way I read the scripture, these religious leaders can be very daunting and intimidating. Uh. The idea I have is they will look at you. So, what have you been preaching? Oh, and there are so many of them. If not mistaken, they can come to around 70 if all are present. But this, Peter, look at them, filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, rulers and elders of the people, and he started preaching. And then in verse 13, what does Luke record? These religious leaders saw the courage of Peter and John. And then they look. Hello, these people are unschooled. They are not like us. They study, we study so much. We have so much knowledge. We know everything. But these people are unschooled. They are ordinary men. They are not like us. We are great people. But you look at them. How can Peter talk like that? With that boldness. And then they took note. They had been with Jesus. And if you look at these two verses, I want to answer this question. I have been asked, uh, I had this nephew, uh, he asked a lot of questions. So he recently came up for a couple of days and he asked me so many questions. How you know the, I, I don't go through all the details. Now, he will ask my brother when he's in KL. I went down to KL before. My brother will answer question one. My answer question two, by question three, my brother 
will tell him, yeah, you shut up, Edina. You know why? Because by question three, my brother doesn't know how to answer him. So, uh, that's what teachers do. We teachers, we do this. Student ask us the first question when we know. Oh, we are very excited because we know. They ask us the second question and we know. And then we answer. And then everybody look. Wow, Mr. Koi really know everything. Man, uh. And they ask us the third question and we don't know how to answer. You haven't been doing your work. Uh. Go back and read your book. Uh. Okay, so that's what teachers do. So, reputation intact, right? Mm. So, he asked me. And... Um, I had a good time with him, and uh, I, uh, he was very happy. You know, he came out. He said, then I told him, young man, in my years working uh, with the Word of God, I've been asked so many umpteen questions, and I can let you know there is nothing new under the sun. People will ask you, how do you know God exists? How do you know Jesus resurrected for dead? The Bible is actually written by men, not by the Holy Spirit. There's nothing new under the sun. And here is one question that I have been asked on and off. How to have the power of the Holy Spirit working in my life? You see, sometimes you talk about church, you talk about all this. We love the church, but at the end of the day, when a person is struggling, he needs to experience the power of God. So he wants to cut through all the other things and say, how can I experience the power of the Holy Spirit? Verse 13 is the answer. The religious leaders took note that this man had been with Jesus. And this is the first insight I want to impart to all of us. That if you really, really have spent time with Jesus, then the Spirit of God, the power of the Holy Spirit will slowly, slowly grow and manifest in your life. It's that simple. That the person of Christ, Jesus, works in tandem with the Holy Spirit. And as a man spends time with the Lord, and I am not going to give you any particular approach. We spend time with the Lord differently. I... Sing lah, I'm not too sure lah. But I think if you ask Alvin how to spend time with Jesus, oh, Alvin will tell you, take a guitar and worship. <laughs> I think so lah. Then if you ask me, you ask me, so pastor, how to spend time with Jesus? Ah? Where is your Bible? I forgot already. So never mind, I buy you a new one, okay? Uh, then you read the word. Different people will work through it differently. Some will go into prayer for long periods. But this is something that will always be true. When a man or woman has spent time with the Lord, then the power of the Holy Spirit will be manifest. And if you run down to verse 31, after they prayed, verse 31 of Acts chapter 4, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. The power of the Holy Spirit is first and foremost manifest in boldness. It is manifest in boldness. Many of you may not uh, remember uh, or you all look at me. I stand here. And then uh, I, I look pretty confident. Uh, look, look pretty confident. Uh. But I can let you know, I am not a very confident man. And um, I am someone who uh, I is quite diffident. And uh, sometimes uh, I'm not a very bold person. Okay, <laughs> I'm not a very bold person. But 
I want to thank God by the grace of God. Every time I come up, without fear, there will be two pieces of scripture that I will read, two verses. Number one is, I need to remind myself that Jesus must become greater and I must become less. This is from John the Baptist. And the other one is from Exodus 3, where I like Moses, not because uh, I say I can, uh, I can open the Red Sea you know, to God working in him. I like him because I think uh, when you read uh, Exodus 4, you will find that uh, he is also quite a defeated person. Uh. And he went to ask God, you know, if I go and talk to Pharaoh like that, you know, this, then the, will they listen to me? Then uh, who has sent me? And uh, I never feel like just now before I came up, I will say, the Lord has sent me up here. And it gives you a sense of bonus to all the cell leaders. Don't think I don't know the Bible enough. Don't think I don't pray enough. Don't think I don't worship enough. Don't think I'm not good enough. If the Lord has put you in that position on Friday before you run the cell, you read your scripture and say, the Lord has sent me. Once you can know and be aware that the Lord has sent you, the Spirit of God fills you, and then your cell members will look and say, wow, our cell leader today very different, oh. Oh. because the not because of his power, it's because the power of the Spirit of God has rested upon him. Bonus. Then you may think, only defeated people, those people scared, scared, need the power of the Holy Spirit, the bonus of the Holy Spirit. No. I have talked to you, I've given Samson a supernatural strength. I've talked about Peter and John with bonus now we move uh, 1,500 years further on and talk about this little monk, Martin Luther. And in Martin Luther, you will find Acts chapter 4, verse 31 coming alive. Because this Martin Luther had been going against the Roman Catholic Church at that time. And the Roman Catholic Church was a powerful organization during that period of the 16th century. And uh, going against the church, you are also going against the Holy Roman Emperor. And finally, after he was excommunicated, he was summoned to this place in Germany. They call it Worms. Uh. And then that Worms, they say W-O-R-M-S, uh, but they think it's the German uh, Worms. And... The assembly was called of the governing body, presided by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Young emperor, but with the weight of the whole empire upon him. Summon this little monk. What they wanted was this. He came. They put the books before him. These are the things you have written. All we want is don't create trouble. Just say you are wrong. <laughs> Just say you are wrong. What do you say? And then we can all bye-bye go back. <laughs> because that was what they agreed between the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. You just say you are wrong. Then after that, we will review, we submit your application, we will communicate back to you, we won't excommunicate you, okay? And history tells us, it's recorded, Martin Luther is supposed to be a mighty man of God. And uh, I just read that yesterday. Lah. When he was confronted with that question, his answer was barely audible. When barely audible means, huh, it's like student, huh, when you want to discipline. Huh? So what did you do? Did your homework or not? No, 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 sir. Oh, scared. It was barely audible. He... Because, you see, he no knew the people before him, I think John Hulse and all this, this man of God that had 
try to reform the church, all of them, either they are burned on the stake or they are beheaded, right? So he did not answer the, the whole assembly, the weight of the whole empire. Everyone was looking at him. Barely audible, he answered, can you give me more time? And the emperor heard it. We give you 24 hours. Something happened that night. Uh, you can go and read it. And the power of the Holy Spirit came to him. And the next day, I think it was the 18th of April, 1521, when he was with the emperor, they were astonished. He came. Just like me holding the mic. I'm <laughs> not but there was a supernatural bonus and in clarity, word by word, he confronted the emperor and the whole assembly. And uh, finally, what came out was this. Uh, he says this, that my conscience is by the Holy Scriptures, by the Word of God. And I cannot recant unless you can show to me from the Word of God that I have heard. And uh, it's debatable whether he said the last few words. Uh, and uh, it says this, uh, Here I stand. I can do no more. God, help me. Now, I'm bringing this piece of history to you to show you two things. Mighty men of God that you read, they have their times when they meet situations when they are scared. And when you look at the, read about the bonus, it is because they have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And just, Every single one of us. If you learn to share the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit, if you learn to take yourself in the power of the Holy Spirit, if you learn to do ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit, if you learn to confront situations in the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a supernatural bonus that will come upon you. That is why we say you will never be the same again. And uh, here is where I want to move on. The first one, if you want the power of the Holy Spirit to be experienced in your life, you need to spend time with Jesus. There is no shortcut. Number two, that you may have all these thoughts about, I cannot, uh, I am not good, uh, or I'm afraid, uh, but... All men, when they are filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter, you look at him. He was not a very bold man. He was someone who has a very big mouth. Yes, he thinks, he says. But when the situation comes, you look at him, he also denied Christ. But at the end, you will find that it was a changed Peter that was, by tradition, asked to be crucified upside down. That's tradition now. Because he said, if you want to crucify me, fine. But I'm not worthy to be crucified the way my Lord is crucified. Can I have a request? Can you do it to me? But upside down. And uh, from someone who could deny Christ to someone who could actually give his life willingly, there must be something that has changed. He already manifested the power of the Holy Spirit that gave him a supernatural bonus. Then the next one, I want to look at Paul. You will find Paul's emphasis is a little bit different. In the, Paul does talk about bonus, but in Paul you will find uh, large sections of Paul's uh, 
talk about the power of the Holy Spirit relates to what the Holy Spirit does in you. And in Galatians 5 verse 16, Paul writes, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Paul's emphasis is always upon the man. That there is a sinful nature in us. And that sinful nature in us has a force that pushes us to do the things that we do not want to do, knowing that we are children of God, but we still do. But Paul says, if you live by the Spirit, then you will have that power to overcome all those desires. And after that, he ends with Galatians 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That Paul is trying to say that it is in the power of the Holy Spirit that you will be able to actually bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And here... I want to emphasize that it is not about self-improvement. It is about the empowerment of the Spirit of God. It's a Spirit-empowered transformation in your character. I have to, uh, uh, in a way, the, um, I would like to uh, let the church see what's in my heart. Because uh, 2018, I'm one of your pastors. Huh? So you must, it's good if you know where your pastor is coming from, correct? Um, I am a man who, from young, has not been very ambitious. Huh? I'm a man of small dreams. When I was young, uh, all I wanted is, I want to be able to work so that I do not need to see my parents, you know, struggle hard, you know. So I want to see the day my father doesn't need to ride his trishaw. I want to see the day my mom doesn't have to iron clothes until one o'clock and wake up five o'clock to wash the clothes. When I look at my brothers, say, I want to work. I want to see the day when my little brothers, they grow up. I'm a man of small dreams. And uh, years pass. My mom and my dad, they are in heaven with the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, it took me some time to realize that my brothers have grown up. In fact, after my, bro my youngest brother, my youngest one, uh, he, when he was the father of two children, I kept on uh, wondering how he would be doing. Sometimes uh, I'll ask him, you're okay or not? No, all this, all this. Until one fine day, uh, I sat down on my bed and think, uh, hey, they have grown up already. Uh, to, uh, uh, I mean, they are father and all this. And uh, when I became a Christian, it was a time when I learned to let go. Lah. So, much of my life has been on small dreams, taking care of the family and all this. Now, long story cut short. Lah. I think uh, if you ask me, uh, so now you are retiring, then you are 60 years old, so every day you go up, you know, you wake up, ma. what's on your mind? My brothers are grown up. Generally, my siblings, they are doing quite well. Financially, they are much better off than me. And that uh, relationally, there are certain things here and there, but they, they are okay. They are doing well. Parents are not around. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I ask, so... What's the next? <laughs> I believe uh, maybe you all are thinking of oh, Pastor Koe. Maybe you're going to take the church to the next level and all this. And everybody will clap hands. I'm very happy. I have to be honest with you. Uh. So I'm a man of uh, small dreams. Uh. I'm already 60. 
and uh, my daily prayer has been uh, because my children are growing up. Rebecca is graduated. Then my Esther also, she'll be finishing a fifth form, looking into the pre U. Uh, and uh, my wife is uh, uh, growing well. Huh? She's sitting in front with me. Uh, okay. So, but I always tell my wife, I say, I must exercise. Sometimes morning, I tell her. You, you went or not for your dancing? I don't know what she does. You come You ask her to demonstrate. Okay. <laughs> All right. But I, every morning, I wake up, I ask the Lord to, I want to be a better person. I was very blessed on Friday. The, I shared the word because uh, my disciple Andrew left me, went to Europe and enjoyed himself, forgot his seafood. So, uh, so he, his task he left to me to do. So I shared and I just told Kenny. I went back reflecting. And uh, personally, I honestly, I can tell you, I think uh, there have been instances where the words that come up from my mouth have not been the helpful words. They have not been wise words, you know. I am not someone perfect. Of course, when we relate with people, you look, oh, wow, you're very good. Huh? But there are times when, you know, we relate, relate. Then certain times we say certain things that are not right. And I told myself, no. I think, uh, wow, this area, uh, I have got a lot of work to do. Lah. Now, I uh, believe lah, um, you all may be wondering, uh, why do I feel like that? Uh? Uh, I thought you are quite okay. Ma. Uh, my friends say, you are quite okay. I am not a uh, troubled, uh, you know, troublesome person, uh, right? Uh, generally, uh. Actually, I'm quite soft, man. so so that is why I'm 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 not a very strong person. But I think it's because uh, when you read uh, Galatians five verse twenty-two, you have two references, and the natural man will refer to the person sitting next to you, which means. Oh, a fruit of the Holy Spirit, oh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Then you look at your friend, uh, I think I'm more loving than you. Lah. I think I'm more joyful than you. Lah. I think I'm more patient than you. Lah. Look at the back. I think I've got more self control, so I'm all right. You become very happy who you are because you have been comparing yourself with men. And when you compare yourself with men, of course, this is from a psychological study. People will always compare with people who are worse than them. That is why they naturally feel good. But the problem begins that when you spend time with the Lord, and suddenly, there is no one else for you to compare. And then, there is only the perfect righteousness of God that stares you in the face. And then, you realize that there is so much that the Lord can empower us. But, I want to put it positively. That in the pursuit of a transformation of your character into Christ-likeness, there are two immediate blessings. I have always told so many people, holiness is a wonderful word. Transforming your character is a blessed pursuit. A lot of people, they see it as a burden. Why want to be more joyful? I can't understand that. Ah. Come on, to become more joyful is our pursuit, correct? Holiness is about being more joyful in the Lord. 
being finding the more rest in the Lord. Who doesn't want that? The immediate blessing is when you decide to ask the power of the Holy Spirit to empower you, work in you, to live by the Spirit, to surrender. Do you know it doesn't take very long? Also, not the next day. Lah. Give yourself three months. You will wake up one morning and find, hey, how come uh, I didn't realize uh, our house, uh, is, uh, our housing estate got a lot of birds. You know, and your wife will ask you, what bird are you talking about? See, I can hear the birds chirping. Your wife is trying to tell you, hey, hello, they've been chirping since the time we moved in. Uh, and you never heard it. Why? Because God has changed you. There is a certain rest in you. And without anxiety, you start to be able to experience so many things that you don't realize. And you find that, hey, I'm happier today, you know. And then you look at your wife. Okay, confess. I never said that to my wife. Lah. But I see people saying, so I want to learn. Lah. Darling, what would you want? <laughs> Yeah, learning, okay? I mean, today, now I practice no profit. So who knows, tonight, I can say, ma, but always take the first step. So on the profit, see, on the profit, anointed, can do anything, all right? So, you will, you will. And then, uh, you will realize, you go to the office, and then, uh, then after that, you see your office people, uh, ch -ch 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 then they say, why, why, you are talking about me, uh? He say, oh. Then they tell you, oh, Mr. Lim, you're very different today. Huh? Every time you come to the office, you score us first before you walk into your room. Huh? Today, you didn't score us. Huh? You change. That's the first blessing. That's the first blessing. God wants you to be happy. But how can you be happy if you only look into all those things that are not right and you don't want to change? But if you just surrender to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, go back and read. Maybe you can follow me, go to Evangel, go and buy this plug, put by the side. Every time I wake up, I look up, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, and all this. Ah, so it always reminds me. The second blessing is, I know all of us, we, in one way or another, we try to bring the good news to our friends. All of us, big ways, small ways. Some of us can talk a bit more, then we share the gospel. Some of us, we don't talk so much. We say, come to church, ah, come to church, we got one event. In some form or some way, we are trying to bring the good news to people. And the second blessing is this. When you are manifesting the fruit of the Holy Spirit, suddenly you realize that your evangelistic efforts begin to start to bear fruit. And you wonder, oh, oh, last time I asked you to come to church, don't want to come. Oh. And why you, you are now coming? Now that I asked you, oh, I also didn't expect you to come. Now you come. He said, different, ma. Last time you keep on scolding, scolding all of us. You ask go to who wants to come. But this past three months, you've been ever one day buy Naslima, another day buy something else. Wow. Now you will change, man. Huh? We like you, so you ask us to come, we come. Huh? You will find the message is only as effective as a messenger. And um, I have shared this before. One of the. One of. Uh, can I say it with humility that uh, by the grace of God, one of the gifts that I have, la, I relate with uh, a lot of people, people uh, who don't feel very good, sometimes they'll call me and they like to talk to me. And sometimes I like to chip in, chip in, chip in, chip in, early on, and chip in, no, no, uh, talk like that, talk like that. One fine day, this young man told me, he said, uh, actually, your advice, uh, some of them are not going to be able You know, I thought my advice so good. You know, I was in my room. But he said, actually, some of your advice are not going to be able to do My ego all deflated. I thought I'm a counselor. Then, after that, but, but every time you 
keep on trying to come and see me. So I wonder, uh, why you come and see me? Uh? Tak boleh pakai. But he say I have to say this, you know. Yo, what you say tak boleh pakai. But when I come and talk to you, uh, I go back, I feel very nice. I feel very troubled, anxious. Uh. I come. Uh. Along the way, I go back. Uh. I feel so relaxed. I feel so joyful. Uh. So, uh, oh, like that. Then I thought about it. Uh. It's impartation. There is this spiritual connection. When a man rests in the peace of God, when he talks to people, he imparts that peace. He imparts the peace. So when the person comes to talk to you, along the way you say something, maybe uh, you can do this, do that, but the fellow says, actually, well, okay. but the way you say it, and then the, when he relates with you, then you nod your head, then say, I pray for you. All this. The person feels good because you are imparting the peace of God. That is why when the Spirit of God works a joy in your heart, it will bubble out when you relate with your friends. Now, this is a blessing that you can impart. Think about it. You tell your friend, I look at you, you, you don't feel, I see you always very sad. That's the joy of the Lord. You know, you, you, in God, God can give you a, a, a joy, you can be happier, all this. Now, if you yourself are papaya face one, you tell Then, he, then the person look at you, uh, yeah, I can help them, but you also don't have the joy. Uh. The message is only as effective as the messenger. And this is what the Spirit of God will want to work in you. And that is why, if you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the word you, we can see it in two perspectives. That you will receive power. You can see it individually and you can see it corporately. In terms of every believer that you will receive that power, that power can change you. It talks to you personally. Oh yes, you will receive power. This is the church. The church will receive power. Then me, no power. It cannot be. Individually, you will receive power. As a believer, the Spirit of God first and foremost will empower you with bonus and the Spirit of God will empower you with that power to be transformed so that you can live out the fruit of the Holy Spirit and first and foremost, you are blessed. I have never met anyone. I have asked people, test people before. I... I'm a teacher, I like to test people, right? So, I, so people say, ah, holiness, ah, wow, holy, holy. Ah. People, are, some of them are Christian. I just want to be ordinary Christian, don't want to be holy. Right? So you know why? Because they think ah, I have to obey this, obey that. You know why I ask? I ask this. I say, ah, do you want to be holy? Uh, I think holiness for you uh, leaders. Huh? Uh, so do you want to be more loving? Yeah, do you want to be more joyful? Oh, yeah. Do you want to have more peace in your heart? Yeah, I want to have more patience. Oh, yeah. You want to be more kind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to be a more faithful person? Yes, yes, yes. Gentle, self control? Yes. You want to be more holy? Yeah. I have never ever met anyone say, I don't want to be more loving. I want to be always sad one. I want to be wicked. I want to lose my tempers. Second, uh, anybody touches me, none. Uh. No one I've met, you find someone like that, you send him to me. <laughs> then I will pass to Melinda to do deliverance. <laughs> hey, uh, I have my job, uh, certain things I can do, uh, but you send to me, I will know where to send to. Okay? Uh. So, always remember, holiness is a good word. Have a holy wife and a holy husband. Praise the Lord. La. You will want to go home and stay at home and don't want to come out. La. Now, 
I am going to the part where the you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That you seen as a group of believers, as a community of Christians, as the church. And here it is in First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 to 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 to 11, we have the charismata, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And here Paul writes, in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 11, to one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. That's a message of wisdom. To one, not to all. That means over that side, Someone has a message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. Here, another one, the message of knowledge. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Faith over here. Another one, miraculous powers over there. At the back, to another, prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different tongues, and still to another an interpretation of tongues. These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And verse 11, all these are the work of the one and same spirit and gives to them each one just as he determines. It is given to each and every one. I want to affirm the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that charismata, is given to the church. It is given to you as a steward. It does not belong to you. It belongs to the church. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And we have so many problems. When people start to see it differently, when they think, I have this gift of prophecy. And they exercise it in terms of what they want to do. They see it in terms of this is my gift. And then sometimes they impose that gift on other people. That means they have this gift of prophecy. I prophesy, you must listen. Because God is speaking to me. So this is just an example. Then for example, I'm a teacher. So I have that gift of teaching. But when I give the teaching, then I use it in order to exercise that gift for my own agenda. Now, I have this gift. Up. You know, I am a great teacher. No? I, once I put down there, you make sure you write your name and attend my class. And then my class come to my office. Why are you not attending my class? So you will find it is not to be exercised like that. And I cannot say, hey, I'm a gift of teacher. You give a prophecy. I know the word better than you. I actually better give than you. It is not supposed to be seen like that. It's a gift to edify and build the church. And this is important. It's so important that Paul had to have a whole chapter trying to tell them, hey, hello, you Corinthians, you have been exercising your gifts in your, with your own agenda. You are trying to compare with each other. My gift is better than your gift. Your gift is better than that. You have to listen to me. I have to listen to you and all this. And Paul is trying to say, hey, hello, it's the same spirit. It's for the body. And, and after verse 11, verse 12 tells us what is in Paul's heart. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all these parts are many, they form one body. You must understand that the gifts of the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church. There is no spiritual superman. There is no one that will hold all the gifts, except, if we, I may say, the perfect man and perfect God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So you will have one gift, she will have one gift, they will have one gift. And in 2018, it is these gifts of the Holy Spirit that when we come together knowing that it is to edify and build the church, that T.O.P. will never be the same again. The, the 
fundamental truth uh, I want to put to you is there are, if it comes to power when it relates to the church, we have only three perspectives. The first is a church that does not manifest the power of the Holy Spirit because they have not spent time with Jesus. Sometimes the church can be full of activity, but the leaders, the members have not been spending time with the Lord. And some along the way, they just don't manifest the power of the Holy Spirit in the church. The second one is, this is uh, something uh, that does happen. They spend time with the Lord. They spend time with the Lord, but they are not totally surrendered. The gifts have been given. It's poured out. And they exercise that gift. But there is no unity of the Spirit. Each one is exercising their gift in their own dominion, you know. The dominion is for Satan, not for us, right? They have their dominion principalities. That, But if it so happens that the church becomes different dominion, I exercise gift of prophecy, I exercise gift of teaching, and you don't see it as a body, that is when the church will not be able to be built and edified up. And the third is what I believe of DOP. La, that today, I believe the, the problem is not the gifts are not poured out. The gifts have been poured out. You all have the gift. After today's message, you just need to seek the Lord and exercise it. But when you exercise it, you have to exercise it in terms of the church. You are one body. And Paul specifically told the Corinthians, don't go and compare. And then that is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, and one, don't go there, he says the fundamental thing, you must have love. If you have not love, you can surrender your body to the flames, you can give all to the poor. Paul says it is nothing. You can prophesy, but if you have not love for the body, for the Lord, it is nothing. So now, I want to put everything together and I want to come back to our dear man, Samson. How did Samson turn out? In Judges 16, verses 19 to 20, very, very sad. Someone who exercised the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon his life, the supernatural strength, but in Judges 16, verse 19, it is recorded, having put him to sleep on her lap. Who was putting him to sleep? The, uh, the Lila. Okay. She called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. The gift was taken away. His strength left him. And verse 20 then she called Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Very, very sad. And uh, uh, always remember, what was wrong with Samson? Did Samson exercise his gift? Yes, he did. Did Samson really move in the power of the Holy Spirit? Yes, he did. Then what happened? Samson forgot God. You can read from Judges 14 down to 16. Samson does not mention God. There is one place in the three chapters you read where the word love, I love you, Powerful word is mentioned. But when Samson mentioned, when that verse was mentioned, you look at 16, it's in verse 15. It was not mentioned by Samson directly. But we know he spoke that. And in the Judges 16 verse 15, then she said to Samson, Delilah, how can you say I love you? That means he said I love you. Lah. And not God, you know. 
He didn't tell God I love you. No, he told the lie lah. I love you. Ah, then if you exercise your gift and you forget God, and uh, at the end of the day, you will find the gift will be taken. So here, I want to encourage the church that if you look at Acts one eight, in Acts one eight, in the Holy Spirit. We manifest the power of God, but you will find that that power of God must, like Paul says in First Corinthians thirteen, must be expressed in love. And I started with this: if you are talking about the love of God, who expresses it among the three persons of the Godhead? It is Jesus, and that is why. You will find this little verse very, very important in John sixteen verse fourteen, where Jesus says, and it is in verse in chapter sixteen that Jesus is saying he's sending the Holy Spirit and all this, and when he reaches verse fourteen, Jesus says, "He, the Holy Spirit, will bring glory to me." That the Holy Spirit will always glorify Jesus, and when Jesus is glorified, it is where the love of God will come down upon you, and you will find that here is where the verse all connects in Acts one eight. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Will you be a witness to the Holy Spirit, or you will be a witness to Jesus? My, the pronoun, is Jesus speaking. That finally, when you exercise the gift, Jesus must be your focus. That the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. I give you two instances because I have studied a bit. Uh, you know, last time they had. All this move of the Holy Spirit. I have always wondered why, when the Holy Spirit moves, and then for six months you have a mighty revival, and then one year later you find that all the fruit is gone. There have been instances here and there, and you will find one common factor is this: that when the Spirit of God moves in His power, that along the way. We all focus on the power. Once you focus on the power and the manifestation, and you forget Jesus, at the end, it will not last. And here, I want to be holistic. Even as we look to the Holy Spirit for the anointing of power, we want to carry the love of Christ in our heart, knowing that the Spirit of God will lead us to glorify Jesus. This. Is the uniqueness of the apostles? They were men and women who appreciated the feeling of the Holy Spirit, the power in which the Holy Spirit can bring in the transformation of lives, and the power the Holy Spirit can bring to authenticate the message of the gospel through signs and wonders. But at the same time, they were very, very Christ-centered people. They could move in miracles, but they were always focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And here is where I want to encourage the church that two o one eight is a time when we will want to ask of the Holy Spirit for the anointing of power upon the church. First and foremost, the anointing of power. Upon you and me individually to grow Christ-like, so that when we share the gospel, we will always remember the messenger precedes the message. And second, that we as a church manifesting the charisma, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, there will be a supernatural spiritual working in the church. And the church 
will never be the same again. And here, I want to end with this about gifts, that whatever ministry you are in, always remember, it is the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is a gift, and the Holy Spirit gives it to you, the empowerment to build up the church. It is not about the talents of men. And uh, I want to encourage each and every one of us, always, always remember, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. Can I have a... Uh, the worship team, uh, we want to sing one song and I want to uh, bless and uh, pray for all of us.